We're here to talk to you about the X01. We're going to do this in two parts. I want to give you an in-depth uh, view of the camera itself. A lot of innovation, innovation went into it, and we're going to talk about that in detail. And then it's going to be my pleasure to, uh, to welcome up uh, one of the world's leading, most accomplished photographers and a dear friend, uh, John Stanmeyer. And, uh, and if you haven't followed John's work to date, I can guarantee you're going to after you have a chance to meet him and see some of the incredible photographs uh, that, uh, that he's taken. Um, so before, before we dive right into the DX01, first thing we need to do, given the nature of this camera, is ask ourselves some questions. So just a, just a few simple questions. So do you like to share your photos? Right? Do you share a few photos? Do you share a lot of your photos that you take? Do you take portraits of people or pets? And I don't mean portraits in a studio with set-up lighting. I just mean you know, nice close-ups of the face with a, with a beautiful bouquet in the background. And do you often take photos in very low light, uh, which is something we encounter all the time, especially if you travel quite a bit. You go into a museum, a gallery, dimly lit restaurant, and the like. Well, DX01 has been designed specifically to address those concerns. So it provides instant sharing of all your photos. It allows you to capture absolutely stunning portraits. This is an area where it really excels, and it takes incredible uh, images in, uh, in extreme low light. We refer to it as a professional quality connected camera. So if you go uh, over here, we've got a nice point of sale display uh, just over to the side. And uh, if you look at the packaging itself, this is the tagline. So what do we mean by this? So let's dissect this statement real quickly. So as far as professional quality is concerned, there are a couple of things. The first, of course, is incredibly high quality images. So 20.2 megapixel sensor. But even more important than that, in working with professional photographers, like Robert, who's here, and John, and others that have gone out and photographed with it. What we've heard back from them time and time again is that it, it holds the details in the shadow area and in the highlights uh, incredibly well. It's also professional in the sense that the app, the companion app that controls the camera, the iOS com companion app, is quite sophisticated. In fact, it's gotten incredible reviews of its own. And, uh, and we're very proud of the job the team has done developing that app. We think, uh, we're quite proud of the team. We think it's, it's one of the most elegantly designed uh, capture apps for uh, iOS to date. And the idea is that it's designed to provide all manner of controls that you'd find in the highest end digital SLR, but in, uh, in this iOS device. It's also professional in that, as David mentioned just a minute ago, that it captures in, uh, in RAW. And so the camera, has its own micro SD slot. And uh, the cameras that we typically use, we outfit with a SanDisk Extreme 64 gigabyte card, which, uh, which gives us tons and tons of storage capacity. So we can switch between shooting pure JPEG if we want. With the 64 gigabyte card, it's well over 10,000 images, over 1,300 RAWs. And then we have a super RAW format uh, that I'll talk to you about in just a few moments. And you can see we can capture with that card over eight hours of video at uh, 1080p, 30 frames per second. So that's the professional part. As far as connected, uh, you've heard, starting to hear this term now that it is, in fact, a connected camera. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean, first of all, that it has a physical connection on it. So it actually literally connects directly to your iPhone or your iPad. But more important than that, when we say connected, what we mean is that it's connected to the rest of the world. So that the moment you take a photo without you having to do anything at all, you can tap the share button and you have direct access to all of the, the different photo sharing services that you use today with photos that you capture with your, with your iPhone's built-in camera. It's also connected in a different sense so that if you're out in the field and you want to learn a little bit more about the camera, you have access to the full interactive online user manual and in fact, if you, uh, if you tap getting started in support, depending on the hours of the day, you can have access to uh, a live support agent. So you literally chat with a live support agent, get some tips while you're out in the field. So this really represents uh, the future. And uh, this is what we mean when we're talking about a professional quality connected camera. So one of the things I want to do just over the next few minutes is go in depth on the design and architecture of the camera and explain what the thought process was regarding connectivity, the reliability of the camera and its components, portability, which is key, sensitivity, particularly in extreme low light situations, the ability to be extremely creative, 
and in fact even the fact that uh, it's, uh, it's quite affordable given uh, what it's able to do. So let's, let's dive into connectivity first of all. So as I mentioned, it's been designed to pair exclusively with the iPhone and the iPad. Uh, we worked very closely with Apple's MFI group. It used to be the made for iPad group at Apple, but then when they added the iPhone and the iPad, they changed the name. It's now simply made for iDevices. So we worked very closely with Apple's MFI group on, uh, on the connector itself. And because of that direct connection, the camera becomes one with the iPhone and the iPad. It becomes one with the Apple ecosystem. So that means if you're at home and you take a lovely portrait with the, with the camera, uh, you can post it to Instagram directly. If you're out on the street, you still have that same capability. If you're in the middle of the woods, it doesn't really matter where you are, take the photo. If you like it, you have the ability to share it immediately. And not just through one service, be it Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, but literally through every service supported by Apple's iOS every service. So no need to log in to your additional accounts again. Whatever services you're using for iOS today, those simply just, just work. And that's uh, thanks to Apple's ecosystem and specifically their iOS share kit. And it's not just some images. There's some cameras out there that, that have built-in Wi-Fi that give you the ability to share your photos. It typically tends to be a one-off, you know, this photo, maybe I'll, I'll share it and I'll actually go through the motions to actually transfer that photo to an online service. In our case, every photo that you capture with the One is automatically transferred to your iOS photos library, every photo. And, uh, and so that means that all of the photos that you take with your DxO One are right there in your iOS photos library alongside the photos you take with your iPhone's camera. All of it. We're going to hold, per the, the guys are broadcasting this, they've asked that we hold all the questions till the end, if that's OK. It's just easier for them to edit it together. But please, please make note of your questions, and then John and I and, and others will be happy to answer them at the end. So, so all of your photos with the DX01 are in the uh, iOS Photos library, and uh, every single one that's captured by the camera are accessible. When we talk about reliability, there's a couple of things that come to mind. First of all is the connector itself. So I'm happy to report that we actually received our very first patent on the connector design. Uh, there are still two additional patents pending, but the first patent has, in fact, been granted. And a lot of work went, went into this. Uh, it's designed to hold securely to your iPhone and iPad, but also break away when need be, given a certain amount of force. And that's part of the Apple specification, so that at no point are you in danger of damaging the lightning connector on the phone. It will break away uh, first before that would be allowed to happen. It's been designed to be connected in a single motion. So the idea is it's that if you've got your iPhone in, uh, in one hand, your iPhone or your iPad, and you take this out of your pocket like so, and it is incredibly small as you can see, you can open up the connector with a single motion of your hand. So that pops the lightning connector out, and you then connect it to your iPhone or your iPad, and then immediately the application launches and now the iPhone's retina display becomes the viewfinder and the camera control center for the camera. So they really become one by connecting the two together. We've tried to make that, that connection process as quick as, and easy and seamless as possible. Uh, there's been some questions in the field about how do you hold it, right? There are a number of different ways to hold it. I can hold it like this, I can hold it with two hands, I, this swivels, the connector swivels plus and minus 60 degrees. There's flex circuitry inside there that allows us to swivel it. So I can hold it directly over my head at a concert like so with the lens pointing straight out towards the stage and I can still compose the shot and get what I need. I can do, switch it the other way, rotate the other way, put it down at eye level for children like so or hold it at waist level. And uh, in fact, uh, when John talks in a minute, one of the things he'll talk about is the fact that reminded him of the old days of, of holding it like a Roloflex at waist level. And this is really also great for discrete street photography because you're out on the street like this, even here in New York, it looks like you're checking your email or something, and yet you're composing shots and, and firing away. Um, it also features, by design, a very compact lithium ion battery. So in order to keep this design as small as possible, we, we opted to design in a 750 milliamp hour lithium ion battery that fits right about here in the, uh, in the interior of the casing. Now, every ounce of that, that juice in the battery is precious. 
And so in studying photographers for the last couple of months and how they use it in the field, we've implemented some sleep-wake cycles. So if you're, if you're using the camera and it goes idle for a period of 50 seconds, it immediately goes into a sleep mode. And to, to wake it up and shoot again, you just tap on the display as you would expect and you're back shooting again. So we're trying to make really, really good use of the battery power. Here's the point I want to make about that. When you're actually viewing the image in the viewfinder of the camera, you are in fact streaming HD video to the iPhone. So we are, we are capturing HD video, encoding it, and streaming it across the lightning connector to the display. That's how you actually get to see the image that you're capturing with the camera. So it's streaming HD video full time. If you were to not let it go to sleep and use it continuously, you'd get anywhere from an hour and a half to, to two hours worth of uh, shooting time on it, which may not sound like a lot, but it's been designed as a companion camera for what is already a very capable camera in your iPhone. Being completely transparent here and up front, if you go out where light is prevalent and you take a photo of something like the Empire State Building, the Golden Gate Bridge in this case, you take it with your iPhone 6 Plus or 6S Plus and you take the same photo with your DX01, to the layperson, there are very few differences. There's a difference in the aspect ratio between the two and there's higher resolution in the, of the 20 megapixels in the DX01 and slightly different color rendering, but apart from that, for the layman, the images are going to look somewhat similar. So the iPhone takes excellent photos, landscapes, panoramas outside. Where the DX01 really comes into play and where it benefits you is when it comes to portraits and low light. So if you look at images, like an image like this taken with the iPhone 6 Plus, the skin tones look a little bit awkward. It doesn't, just doesn't look as, as appealing. You put on the DX01, you compose the shot, you get that, that nice, sharp detail in the eyes and the face, but a, that shallow depth of field with a beautiful bouquet in the background. This is a, a photo taken under exactly the same controlled lighting conditions. This is with the iPhone 6 Plus. And you can see the skin tones are, he kind of looks like a Dorito, and uh, forehead is blown out a bit. Very same photo taken with the DX01. Beautifully rendered flesh tones. Highlights are perfectly handled, so huge difference. If you think about it, as you, as you walk around the city and you look at, at Apple's massive worldwide billboard campaign, you know, shot on the iPhone, they're gorgeous images. You see images of sunsets and mountains and rivers. You don't necessarily see portraits of people on those billboards, right? Because the sheer physics of it, the small sensor size and the ca small camera lens are not really optimized necessarily for portraits. And that's where the DX01 comes into play. And then the second area is in extreme low light situations. So this was when I was in London uh, this summer and I visited uh, Churchill's War Rooms in uh, Whitehall and uh, they're all preserved as they were. Shoot that with an iPhone 6 Plus, take the DX01 out, attach it, take the very same photo with the DX01. It's as if somebody turned on the overhead lights. Same thing here, this is at a church in Paris, uh, Madeleine, in a very deep, dark recess of the church with the iPhone 6 Plus, and the very same image captured with the DX01. So incredible detail and phenomenal low light capabilities. The other thing that we did this summer in working with a lot of photographers and studying how they work is, of course, we learned there's some photographers that want to mount their iPhone to their tripod. So using something like the MiPhoto Sidekick 360, this is just going to hang perfectly off on the side. It's not going to go anywhere. And in those instances, if you're shooting a sunset, for example, you want to be there for hours. And you're taking hundreds of photo, photo after photo, bracketing, adjusting white balance to get the perfect sunset. And uh, this one, for example, with that photographer, a friend of mine was taken on top of Mount Parnasse Tower uh, facing the Eiffel Tower. And he took during this period of time, I think, some 500 exposures until he got exactly the one uh, that he wanted and the sun had just dipped over the horizon. So this is a typical setup for a landscape photographer where you're mounting the iPhone or the iPad to your tripod. The DX01 is simply attached to the side firmly. It's not going to go anywhere. And in the latest software update, we actually modified the firmware so that you can connect to an external juice pack. So in this case, I've got this the micro USB cable connected to a Jackery Giant juice pack. And I can actually shoot 
while I'm, while I'm charging, so shoot while charging. So there you can just let it run for hours at a time. Let's talk about portability for a moment. So the old adage is, of course, the best camera is the one that you have with you at all times. Right? You never know when you're out there and you're walking around on the beach, the sun sets, a surfer comes walking up, and you're thinking, you know, I wish I had my high-end mirrorless camera with me. I wish I had my digital SLR, you know, and maybe you don't. You just went out for a walk that evening. The DX01 is designed to be small enough to have with you at all times, so it's there when you need it. Maybe you're walking along a boardwalk somewhere and you see the skyline in the background, and you think that would make for a nice photo. At 108 grams, it is in fact lighter than an iPhone 6, so incredibly light. At uh, well under three inches tall, it's about the size of half the deck of cards. Or a review that just was published today in Macworld, the journalist said that it's smaller than his wallet, right? It's got his wallet stuffed with bills and credit cards and the like. So very, very compact. We like to say that it's smaller than the grip of a typical digital SLR. So incredibly, incredibly compact. And when I met David yesterday and he asked to see the camera for the first time and I took it out of my bag and, and, and let him hold it, he asked, so what, what, size, uh, what size sensor is in there? And I told him it's a one-inch format sensor, and he didn't believe it. So what, what, how is that even possible? Because we're all familiar with one-inch format cameras, like, for example, the very popular uh, Sony RX100. And in fact, the DX01 uses exactly the same one-inch format sensor as the RX103. Very same sensor, one-inch format, but designed into an incredibly compact package, so it's, it's amazingly portable. When it comes to sensitivity, we've talked a little bit about its capabilities in extreme low light. Well, how is that possible? So if we look inside of the camera, first of all, you've got this sensor that I just mentioned. So it's a 20.2 megapixel, one inch backside illuminated sensor, which is 6.6 .6 times larger than the iPhone's camera sensor. So considerably larger than the camera sensor in the iPhone. In fact, the size of the pixels is almost double that of the, the new sensor in the iPhone 6S and 6X Plus. So 2.4 micron pixel size versus 1.22 uh, microns. So bigger pixel buckets mean you have the ability to capture more light, of course. The lens is a custom design by DxO, by our image scientists. It's got six spherical elements. And uh, it's got a six-bladed iris, so it'll close down to f11, and it'll open up to a maximum aperture of f1.8. That's an f1.8 aperture versus f2.2 of, uh, of the iPhone camera. Take those three things together, the size of the sensor, the size of the pixels in the sensor, and the speed of the lens, and that equates to having 10 times the sensitivity of the iPhone camera, 10 times which amounts to 3.3 full stops of additional exposure. So, uh, so it's quite capable in extreme low light. That means when you're out at twilight, no problem capturing uh, the dimming light or indoors, and you know, all the detail is there and, and exposure is, is easily rendered in even some of the, the dimmest lighting conditions. This is the illumination just coming from, uh, from my friend's iPad on his son. Now creativity, I mentioned the, the app previously, so let's just talk about that for a moment. Um, the app has been designed to be uh, incredibly powerful and yet uh, very, very intuitive. So what you have on the left-hand side when you go into the advanced modes like program, aperture priority, speed, shutter speed priority, or full manual, is you have your controls on the left. Tapping on those opens up the individual controls that you can just dial in specifically. In the overlay buttons on the right, you have the ability to easily switch between your capturing formats, JPEG, RAW, Super RAW, your built-in timer, two and 10 seconds, and the flash. We actually use the flash of the, of the iPhone itself, but we tend to use it, we tend to use it more, like a, uh, more like a torch as opposed to that bright, bright burst. And what's great about it is that it's, it's a distance away from from the, uh, the camera itself. And so, uh, so you get a nice off-axis light, uh, which, uh, which makes for, uh, for really nice flash photography. And again, it's not a burst. It's more of a, more of a continuous, continuous flash shooting. 
Uh, in addition, in full manual mode, you can see there's an exposure meter in the, uh, in the center. Uh, there's a, in addition to the physical shutter button, which is on top, there's a soft shutter button on the left-hand side, and that also serves to switch easily between capturing photos and capturing video. So a really, really elegant application that allows you to set your ISO, to set the aperture where you want it, get a beautiful bouquet in the background, and capture some stunning portraits uh, similar to this. Going in the other direction, and John will talk about some of the images that he captured with the DX01, we have long exposure times as well. So you want to do starry night photography. Currently, we support a maximum exposure time of 15 seconds, although based on feedback from the likes of John and other photographers, in the next release that's coming next month, we're extending that out to 30 second exposure time. So it's very easy for us to make changes in software and firmware. Because the app is provided by the iTunes App Store, you, uh, you receive those updates uh, uh, automatically. And again, so you, you decide you're walking down the bridge and you want to get uh, a gorgeous image like this with, uh, with longer exposure time that's uh, easily accomplished with the app. So it allows you to be uh, quite creative. And then there's this other format you may have heard about that we call Super Raw. So this is, this is an innovation developed by our image scientists. When you tap and you engage Super Raw, when you depress the shutter, instead of capturing one raw, you're actually capturing four full resolution raws at the same time in very quick succession. So it blasts off four raws at full exposure. They're all exposed exactly the same. So it's not like HDR where they're bracketed differently. They're, bra they're the same exposure. We then use the very latest in spatial and temporal noise reduction to actually remove the noise. So we're not only analyzing thousands of neighboring pixels to determine what's part of the image and what's noise, we're looking at noise between the images themselves as well. And the super raw image processing is accomplished on the companion desktop software. And the desktop software, as this gentleman asked me earlier in the day, uh, runs on both Mac and PC. Okay, so there's, uh, there's Connect, which is a very seamless way to import your photos or automatically optimize them for you. There's DxO Film Pack, which has over 80 legendary film stocks and some designer presets that you can apply to the images. And these are applied directly to the RAWs themselves, another great reason to, uh, to capture RAW. And you can also import directly into our award-winning desktop application, uh, Optics Pro, which gives you full control over all aspects of the, uh, of the RAW. And then something new developed this summer. So uh, when Apple held their developer conference in June, and they introduced the new version of OS X El Capitan, you'll notice there uh, one of the new features that was, uh, that was mentioned is uh, new photos extensions. And uh, so we had our team jump on that. And uh, I'm happy to announce that in the ne within the next two weeks, uh, Mac users will be able to download a new photos extension uh, that will allow you to process the RAWs and the Super RAWs uh, directly within OS X Photos. And so the way this is going to work is you, you, shoot your, you shoot your photos with the DX01. You then tether it with the micro USB cable to your Mac. That's OS X Photos El Capitan. You import the images. Uh, essentially, we capture a RAW and render out a JPEG. So you see the little J badge that says you're actually browsing the JPEGs. Import both the RAWs and the JPEGs. And then when you want to work on any particular image, OS X Photos in the edit mode allows you to switch to use the RAW as the original. So it's RAW plus JPEG. You're browsing the JPEG. You can actually switch that to say, no, now I want to actually work with the RAW itself. So you switch to the RAW. And then at that point, using the brand new extensions, you have the ability to call up our extension. And it will automatically recognize that the image was shot with the DX01 and apply optical corrections, as well as smart lighting, which improves the dynamic range of the image and even uh, noise reduction. And you have the ability to control ease of the, each of these and, and adjust the intensity and strength of, uh, of the correction, soft, medium, or strong. You also have the ability to add clear view, which is great for landscape images, because clear view will actually automatically minimize 
haze and smog off in the distance in your landscape photos. And it does that for you automatically with a one-click correction. And once you save, a new high-resolution JPEG is rendered out, and that sits in your photos library directly adjacent to, uh, to the rest of your photos. And then lastly, uh, I just want to say a word about affordability. So a lot of work and research and effort went into making the camera this size. Okay, this was, this was not an easy feat. In fact, if we go back to the sensor and the lens design, uh, our chief image scientist, Frederick Guichard, likes to refer to this as an airless design. So the, the optical lem lens assembly that we designed is positioned directly adjacent to the 20 megapixel sensor. There is no gap in between the two. Now, if you did that with apply, without applying any image science, just given the angle of incident of the light coming into the lens, you would experience things like chromatic aberration and vignetting and color shading. But using our image science, we're able to correct for all of that and produce these stunning images from a design of this, uh, of this size. And so that's a lot of work and effort and R&D went into that. In fact, we have uh, 15 PhDs in image science working in our office uh, in Paris. So the headquarters for D DxO is in boulogne billancourt just outside of Paris. Uh, that's primarily where our image scientists and our engineers are. And then we have a, uh, another office in San Francisco as well. But in the Paris office, we have 15 PhDs in, uh, in image science that made this, uh, made this possible. So the ability to share the photos instantly, stunning portraits, and then absolutely amazing uh, capabilities in low light. And then lastly, there's this bit about the automatic update. So I mentioned that in passing earlier. When you, uh, I went through this with David yesterday. He wanted to try the camera last night, so I, I gave him a camera, and he pulled out his iPhone 6S Plus and says, OK, well, what do I do? First step is open up the connector, connect it to your iPhone it then recognizes that you don't have the companion app installed. So it says, go to the iTunes App Store, tap, takes you right there, tap Get. It downloads the app automatically. It's a free app, obviously. And that's it. That's it. No additional setup, no passwords, nothing of the sort. You're, you're up and running at, at that point. Now, because the app is downloaded from the iTunes App Store, just like every other app that you download to your iPhone or iPad, that means that we, as the developer, can provide automatic updates seamlessly in the background. We are all ready. We only just started shipping in the beginning of September in the US and October 1st in Europe. We're already on version 1.1. And we're publicly announcing that version 1.2 is coming before Black Friday. And I'm going to share with you a little sneak peek of some of the features that are coming. And this is based on feedback that we've received from the photographers we've been working closely with. So the first is uh, something we refer to as the advanced viewfinder mode. So you simply swipe down with your finger on the display itself and your capture parameters, for example, your shutter speed, your f-stop, your ISO appear, and the exposure meter appear as an overlay over the image. If you want to dismiss it, you just swipe back up with your finger. All the photographers, of course, ask us, where's the metadata? I'm taking these photos. I want to see the metadata itself. So in version 1.2, which is coming, we've added in an EXIF display. Again, when you're browsing the photos in the gallery, swipe down. We give you access to the place, the location, because we're, get, we're getting the GPS information from the iPhone itself. So all your photos are GPS tagged. There's a, uh, there's a histogram, uh, as well as all all of your uh, EXIF information, shutter speed, f-stop, ISO, and, uh, and so forth. We have streamlined in version 1.2 the ability to update the firmware. It's literally, when the new update appears, tapping on Update Firmware takes you to a screen, and all you have to do is tap Install Firmware. If you've ever updated firmware on a camera, you know what a hassle that's been, right? Get a blank SD card download this file, put it in the root directory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's something that most of us dread having to do. You want the latest firmware for your camera, but it's just such a hassle. With this, because it's directly connected, it's literally tap to install, and the firmware update is automatic. It's downloaded to your iPhone. It's copied over to the camera itself, and the firmware is updated, and it's done. So the most seamless firmware update of uh, any camera in the history of camera firmware updates. Um, 
Uh, we've added in, in version 1.2, advanced controls and video capture. Right now, the video is automatic. We have automatic mode. We have 1080p, 30 frames per second, and we have super slow-mo, 720p at 120 frames per second, but just auto uh, with EV bias, plus minus three stops. We're adding in all c controls, shutter speed, shutter angle, uh, f-stop, ISO, et cetera, and video capture. And the other thing that I, that I forgot to mention is with because this lightning connector is universal, you can actually flip it around so that the lens is facing you. So you're looking at the display and the lens is facing you to take a selfie. And we actually use the, the display as a soft, natural fill light. Uh, that was actually illuminated. Her face in the dark was actually illuminated by this soft, natural fill light from the, from the iPhone's display itself. Today, we only capture selfies in still mode uh, with version 1.2. We're adding uh, selfies in all modes, whether it's program, aperture, speed, priority, et cetera, or, uh, and, and uh, video selfies as well, which would be great for video bloggers. And then, uh, and then another request has come up, and so we've, uh, we've developed an Apple Watch shutter button. So uh, you can use the iPhone, particularly the iPhone 6 and 6S, as its own stand. I've already mentioned that you can mount this on a tripod like so, and so you'd be able to trigger the shutter. Uh, remotely with your uh, with your Apple Watch with a uh, companion app. So, so in a sense, because of the ability to update the camera seamlessly and regularly, it actually gets better uh, after you've uh, after you bought it. As proven by the fact that we've already had one major update to the software, and we have another one scheduled to go right right around the corner. So, all of the desktop software for Mac and PC is included. That includes DxO Connect, DxO Film Pack, and Optics Pro that I mentioned briefly. The software plus the camera sells for only $599 uh, US. Uh, and I believe, we'll talk about it afterwards in the Q&A, but I believe there's some kind of a show special that's uh, taking place in conjunction with uh, Photo Plus Expo. And then lastly, uh, we've been really, really pleased with, uh, with the fact that a number of journalists have been reviewing it in detail and, uh, and doing reviews on it. The coverage has been nothing short of sensational including on the, the front cover of the Wall Street Journal tech section, uh, where Jeffrey Fowler wrote, uh, the tiny new DX01 camera attachment delivers a big upgrade to iPhone photography, or uh, even better, uh, the DX01 is the ultimate big vacation retirement wonderlust new baby like my Instagram's damn it camera. Santa, I've been a very good boy this year. Um, so uh, this is what we mean by a, a professional quality connected camera. We'll be giving personal one-on-one -on -one demos uh, at the show. We have a point of sale display that runs through the, the demos that you can see here as well. And I'll, I'll be happy to stick around with my colleagues and give anybody a, a, a close-up look at the, uh, at the camera uh, if you choose to afterwards. I was on contract with uh, Time Magazine for a little over 10 years, uh, producing 18 covers for them, uh, mostly international covers. I cover uh, quite heavy news uh, and, and historical events. Uh, and then for the last 10 years, uh, I've worked nearly exclusively with National Geographic, uh, producing uh, about 12 covers for them uh, as well. And the uh, next story comes out mid um, 2016. Uh, I do a lot of what we call, um, I don't know why we call it iPhone photography. Um, you don't want to get me started. To me, uh, talking about cameras is, is, uh, and talking about sensors and lenses um, is, uh, is a bit like talking about paintbrushes uh, or pens. Uh, just write, uh, paint. Uh, it really doesn't matter in, in, in many ways, but there is a definite level of quality that, that I have never, ever uh, seen uh, that connects to this uh, ubiquitous uh, camera that ironically makes phone calls uh, since uh, using and quite heavily embracing uh, the DX01. I, I wanted to see what this thing can actually really do. Uh, I'm a street photographer. Uh, I, I, I work almost primarily around the planet. Uh, I don't believe in borders, race, or gender. So to me, uh, I'm off actually to Turkey tomorrow to work on the, the, the mass refugee crisis that's moving through Europe. 
Uh, I'll spend the next two and a half weeks there uh, immediately after Photo Plus Expo tomorrow. Um, and, and I wanted to, to, to really use this camera, the one in a way that I really use a camera. Uh, I want to deal with logistics and problem solving. And what I did on this assignment, uh, I, went to a, I wanted to go to a place I'd never been before. Uh, I have a fascination for the stands. Uh, I have a, a love affair for the music of the stands. Uh, so I went to a Kyrgyzstan a very remote mountainous rugged region, uh, part of the f former Soviet Empire. Um, I, uh, I, I literally went uh, with only um, check-in, uh, no check-in luggage. Um, get out of there. Uh, no check-in luggage. I wanted to see, can I travel and work on a, on a full story with just carry-on luggage? Just wanted to do it. And, and, and sure enough, you can. It was pretty astonishing. Uh, so uh, yes, I, I brought along the, the, the 6 Plus. I'm now using the 6S Plus, which works seamlessly as well. Uh, and and I just, I'm just i not into sh looking at myself working with cameras, uh, but uh, just so you can see how, how we use it uh, in compendium to, to really producing meaningful photography. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, I view this camera uh, a lot like a 6x6 like a, like a six six, uh, view camera, or not a view camera, but a 6x6 six six, uh, film camera, like a Rolleiflex. Uh, it's phenomenal. It it's literally reminds me of the day of working with a, with a Rolly flex, uh, where I can actually watch what's happening and, and, and be inconspicuous. I'm not an inconspicuous type of photographer, though. I do like to uh, not hide that I'm photographing. I don't want to go up to you and go blasting like this or anything like that. But I, you know, I'm not going to hide and pretend that I'm not photographing. But I love the fact that I can interact and watch you it's in, and, and see and, and keep looking down and move. And, but you know, I like to be able to move like this and fluidly to, to be able to be moving with it. It's just astonishing. Um, and so I went about and I've worked the way I work any story, any story for the magazine. I have brilliant landscapes, fast moving objects, way up in the steeps and the highest plateau regions before we reach the, uh, the, the frozen tundra of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I spent uh, many days with, uh, with, uh, with nomadic uh, Kyrgyzstani uh, nomads. Uh, up in the mountains, again, just with, uh, with a backpack and a small change of clothing bag, uh, uh, and that was it. Uh, actually, the bag that I have right back there, which is what I'm also going to go to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Turkey and Greece, and, and this backpack, that was it. Uh, all carry-on luggage. Um, uh, for charging, I do, as Kirk mentioned, and that's amazing that version 2, 1.2, is going to be able to charge right off the back of this. Uh, but I carry around a, a, a brick anyways, a battery brick, is that what we call them, for my, for my 6 Plus. On a typical geographic story, um, we'll do with a DSLR, and, and I'm not a heavy photographer on the button, but yeah, 20,000, 30,000 images. These are, these are two-month assignments, mind you, okay? We're not going out for just two weeks, and this is my holiday. Um, and I will use the camera that, ironically, is in, you know, in my pocket with a phone, and, and now a lot of times with the, with the one, uh, and I'll do 10,000 pictures with this camera. So the, the, the lines are not necessarily completely blurring. They're a different type of paintbrush, a different way to communicate. This I see much more in instant publishing. We're the publishers now. Social media is the incorrect word, in my opinion. It only becomes social when you comment to somebody who's commenting to you. Uh, I'm a publisher. We're all publishers. And so this compendium here is I'm publishing and I'm screaming in the highest quality possible. And I can do it in the steppes of Kyrgyzstan uh, with a local SIM card. And, and I was doing that. It was really, really exciting uh, in a format that, that, that is like a 35 millimeter DSLR with, again, the quality and the, and, and, and the compaction. I love photographing wide open. Uh, so with my Canons, I'll, I'll, I'll use like 1.4 glass. And with the, with the, with the DxO1, I'm at 1.8 all the time. I'm just cranking it as, as, as wide open as possible. It's so magical to get that feeling, the true feel of, of, of what a camera does, that brush that it gives you. So the plants, as this woman is carrying her water jugs to, to get water from a river, uh, you know, the, 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 the compaction, I guess we call it a bouquet. Is that a new word that we use in photography? I never, ever remember <laughs> using the word. Look at the bouquet in my photograph. Okay, <laughs> look at the bouquet of those plants. How about that? Uh, or bouquet of roses. But uh, you know, details everywhere. It's just astonishing. Uh, incredibly complex light that I would never be able to work in with just the camera that's in the iPhone. Uh, backlit, sun setting, steam coming up. She's making tea. 
all the detailed layers. If you were sitting here on the monitor here, we were on a projection with these LED lights. There's details in all of these, all of these sheets. Oh, you're a little bit here. Yeah, you can see it on this better here. Look, I mean, the incredibly complex light that I'm even astonished when a DSLR can do it. And I have it right now in my pocket, in my hand. It's just astonishing. Uh, again, very, and now we're starting to get dark. I love to work in darkness. Uh, I'll never forget the, the working in Djibouti, which ended up being that, that world press picture. Uh, my translator fixer said it was getting dark, sun setting, and he says, well, you want to go to your hotel? Uh, and I said, no, the lighting's getting great. This is when I want to work. Uh, you can work in absolute dark light, and you'll see coming up. Now, talk about complex lighting again. In a yurt, backlit, door light only, no, no internal light, full detail in the table, in the husband, in the shadows, in her. Uh, I think I'm cranking the ISO pretty heavily here. Bear with me. Uh, let's look at the metadata. I'm not a metadata -y kind of guy. Uh, 3200 ISO at 1.8. And wait till you see when we crank it up even higher. Full detail everywhere. Uh, look at the detail on his face. Astonishing. Whoopsie daisies, wrong spot. But anyways, astonishing. Uh, landscapes, again, really, really complex, low light situations. Uh, it handles all the dynamic range. Um, backlit again, phenomenal detail. And it's getting dark. We're, we're again, and I don't know, I don't study ISOs. We're at 800 ISO, 2.2. Again, I love that, that, that fast glass. Um, suddenly, two children appear out of nowhere. <laughs> Um, a, a slow shutter speed, the ability to have mo movement and motion in a reportage, street photography sort of way of approach. Uh, and again, very complex light where we're getting detail in the skies, uh, detail in the shadows, full dynamic range everywhere. Not high dynamic range or whatever that HDR stuff is. I don't, I don't, I'm not an HDR type, uh, but real tonality. Uh, this is, uh, what is the uh, ISO on this? I, I remember it was, it, was, it was pitch dark. We're at 6400 ISO 1.8. So if any of you guys have ever worked with a Canon or a Nikon, right, or a Leica. I used to have a, a Nocti Lux. I remember when I had a 510. Boy, to get that thing focused was you were really lucky if you did. Uh, but this is you're you're almost at 1.0, right? Uh, and, and at 6400 ISO, the detail that you get is just astonishing. In light that I remember sitting here going, I wonder how far I can push this. And I actually got full detail in the plastic, in the strainer here, in the rock. It, it's just astonishing. And now this. I wish you could see it on my laptop. Uh, you know, with all due respect to the monitors on the wall, they're kind of brighter than I would tone it. Um, it's really dark in this situation. Uh, uh, I remember thinking, am I going to be able to push it? Again, 64, 40th of a second, handheld. Handheld. Oh, I do everything handheld. Uh, I, I don't. Well, I, there will be one tripod photograph I'll show you. Um, I ran across this, this, this ancient, uh, very old, must have been five, 600 year old Islamic cemetery. Uh, way on the outskirts of, 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 uh, of the capital. And, and the tonality, I, I think the color rendition is more correct here. Really rich colors, detail within the shadows of the sand walls. Um, uh, I love there's in, in, in Optics Pro, the tools in Optics Pro are just nothing less than astonishing. Uh, you can bring out this beautiful detail that's in the raw file. Uh, because it is raw, I'm not doing JPEG plus raw and all that other stuff. I don't want to have two files to manage. It's up to you if you want to do that, but I just find that to be a, an organizing hunk of madness. Uh, but, the, but the details in it from dynamic whites, uh, and I always do everything a little dark. So if you want to afterwards, come over here. I'll show you on the monitor that I'm a little bit, maybe a half a stop under type. When I did Kodachrome in the film days, uh, I would take Kodachrome uh, 64 and run it at 50, uh, 25, run it at 20. Um, incredibly complex light. I think this is more the tonality range. A, a dark, you know, a thunderstorm coming in. Just beautiful detail in the rusting fences and all these old graves. And I just was fascinated by, by, by the, the context of what can be captured uh, with it. Uh, so I just sort of went berserk in this landscape of this old cemetery. Um, I photographed trees in motion for the last 10 years. 
Uh, it's a personal project. If you're a photographer, I hope you have as many personal projects as you can possibly have uh, because they, they help you grow visually, spiritually, personally. Uh, I photograph trees in motion, and, 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 and uh, whether I'm on a bicycle, car, motorcycle, walking, running. Uh, and, and I always felt a little bit hindered with my iPhone. I can't control shutter speed. I get what I get. Sometimes before the, 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 the one, I would take my iPhone, I'd shake it, and I'd go, and it was kind of like, Nye. Uh But it always worked really well you know, with, with a DSLR. Well, now with, with the one attached, I'm able to do my tree photography like I've been doing all over the planet, uh, controlling uh, because it has f-stops. Uh, and, and now we're going to have 30th of a second. Oh my gosh, it's even more incredible. Uh, I can go in and I can paint. Uh, and that's what I love about tree photography. I, I, I just, this is how I photograph trees. Trees are alive. They just move in tree time. They move all the time, but we can't see them because they, they move at a different, different speed than human time. Uh, and, and I just look at this. The trees are running. They all have like little legs going. And it's just so much poetry. And, I, and I'm just walking through the car, out the camera. And it's a 35 millimeter frame. And it's right in my pocket. It's just astonishing. Um, and so I just have fun. So I, I threw this in. I wanted you to see it. Uh, that, that, that it's a camera that it's like a brush, right? That, let's not get into the anecdotal parts of it, although the science in, in, in here is just astonishing. Uh, but I want to just paint how I want to paint. Uh, and I can do that at any time. I'm not a landscape photographer, um, uh, but I thought, you know, what can this thing do in, in these motion moments? Uh, I live up in New England and in, in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires. We have fall right now. Well, it was kind of fall at this altitude and this beautiful river running through on a tripod, yes. Uh, I used at the time, now we can do with the iPhone watch, uh, uh, but I have a, a Bluetooth trigger uh, thingamajigger that, that connects to the, to the iPhone. So you have it on the tripod, you don't have to, have to push the button and create any vibration, and you just take photographs wirelessly. I mean, <laughs> hello. And, uh, and, and beautiful long exposures of, of moving water. Uh, imagine what you could do if you're really a, you know, a water landscape photographer, and I, I'm not. Uh, no, I don't mind landscapes when something's happening. I've got to have something going on, preferably people, or in this case, sheep leaping across uh, uh, waterways. You know, very, very fast movement. Uh, consider this like my version of sports photography. Uh, this is Hussein Bolt, you know, doing, doing his thing. Uh, and uh, uh, just beautiful landscapes, beautiful color renditions. Again, if you can see on my monitor, there's full details in the, in, in the animals and in the highlights, it, it, you know, the dynamic range of raw. And this isn't even super raw. Uh, wait till you see what Super Raw does. Uh, it, it is, you know, it, 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 it's really cranking its maximum potential. Um, I went and, and went to a, to a Russian wedding, uh, welcomed by this family. Uh, the way I work, fluidly in the home, welcomed in, able to compose in my natural 35 millimeter frame. Uh, it, it, it absolutely flawless, again, in really complex light. Backlit window, detail in the window, detail in the doorway, detail in the blinkly, blinkly strawberry things that are hanging from the, from the doors, uh, you know, and detail in her hair. You know, you, you, how, how do you get this? And it's all right in your pocket. Um, and I love very dark photography. Uh, the, this is the wedding reception. We followed them. It's a simple picture, but I love these moments of uh, her, her hair was dyed red. It picks up the red colors. I love the coolness of it. I didn't really do much adjusting with it. Uh, I use Optics Pro to get in all this detail in the white. I probably could have cranked it even further and gotten even in more detail. Uh, but phenomenal dynamic range in an incredibly complex lit se uh, situation. Look at the detail in her eyes. It's, it's all there. Um, layered complex lighting, uh, you know, still detail in, in, in the face, in the ear, in the cheek, in the dress, in the window, outside, uh, all in layers and with compaction. Um, I love layered photography, so I'm able to work in a way and get down low. I wanted to just get all of these pieces, nobody laying on top of each other. I'm very much into the design element of the natural world around us. My, my look at the world and the art that I do in photography is the hyper-reality, the, the power of extreme reality. Uh, it's just playing out and before us all the time. I just love to see it and wait for it to happen. And here I can get down very, very low, and I can be sitting, talking, looking, and, and I can watch the scene. I'm watching human theater, and it's playing out. I don't have to have it up to here, although I don't mind doing that sometimes. Uh, but I don't have to 
just have this, because I feel like I'm holding kind of a giant credit card in my hand or, or, or whatever, or a miniature book, because I read books on this thing, uh, I can actually sort of work like I'm holding a, a, a real camera without having, and not being blinded. It's almost like having a rangefinder. It's like using a Leica. You can actually see the image people coming in the frame. Um, and, and, and so, you know, again, I, I love layers, simple things. I went to a cattle market. That last picture is from the cattle market. Lovely, lovely Kyrgyzstani man. Um, you know, some of the things of details and the, and, and the compaction, the bouquet. Gosh, where did we come up with bouquet? L look at the detail in this guy's socks in the sense and also with the, the, the compaction or the out of focus or the bouquet or whatever you want to call it uh, of it. And what is the F stop? I haven't got a clue. 2.5. Imagine if it was, uh, if it was um, you know, if I'd done it at 1.8. Astonishing. But I love this sort of, you know, cutting things off and details, little moments. I love this sort of play of dance here with the man here, the, the tool, the horse's head between the legs, the handshake, his toolbox. And once again, incredibly tack sharp. Look at that. Look at the sweat on his hands, every bit of detail. The sci I don't even understand the science in this, but it, it's just beyond human comprehension. Uh, again, layers, complex colors. Uh, this is how I work at a geographic story, and I got to do it all uh, from a backpack. Uh, no, no, you know, rolling bit of kit. Uh, it, it was all just in my pocket. Um, you know, there was a performance at the at a, in a field in the middle of nowhere up in the mountains. Now here is where it gets very, very interesting. Look at the complex light in this, where light is coming through the whole of the yurt coming in on one woman's body, wearing white, mind you. Uh, you have to get a detail that, that's a little brighter. Maybe this is a little better. Um, I probably could have pulled a little more detail into it. I've just put this together late last night before driving down. But we have detail in the, in, in the tops of the yurt. Here you can maybe see it better. We're even picking up the red uh, uh, wooden slats that keep the dome in shape. Detail in the shadows and still detail in the highlights. I mean, yeah. Uh, and what are we got here? We got 800 ISO, 8 thousandths of a second. Clearly, I didn't even need to go that high ISO. I love the, uh, the fact of underexposing, so I'm, I'm almost three stops under. I love that control. And I do uh, aperture priority mode. I always just call it automatic, because I don't want to think. Um, I just want to feel uh, the photograph. I want to just see whatever I'm doing and, and just feel it and not get lost in the technicalities. And this is where the one is just off the charts. Uh, this was my yurt uh, for two nights, uh, way up in the mountains, and literally the Milky Way uh, right before me. Um, get a load of this. Uh, 12,000 ISO, 2.8. Probably could have gone even faster. What the hell was I doing at 2.8? Um, 15th of a second. Oh, I know why. Because when you get to a 30th of a second, I can even crank it further. Oh, that's going to be incredible. You'll be able to go 6,000 ISO. Oh my goodness! Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but you can do it at twelve thousand, and it, it looks like you're, you know, like you're doing it at one hundred ISO. Um, but, uh, but but look at this! It's just nothing less than, than gobsmackingly off the top. I couldn't see all this with my eye. I could see the Milky Way. I could, knew it was there. But when that frame came off after my little Bluetooth button was pushed and it appeared on the screen, and, and, and it throws in, if I'm not, mis I'm not an engineer, but it throws a JPEG into your iPhone folder, right? The RAW is living in this card. Uh, and it easily connects, downloads, blah, 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 blah. And I go, oh my god. Oh my goodness. Uh, and, and even on my DSLRs, I use the monitor. They're so small on a DSLR, so don't try to think you're going to edit on the back of a DSLR. You can actually start to edit on real estate this size. Uh, but I use it as a light meter. So now I actually have it as a light meter, and I can actually, the screen's large enough that I can edit in field. Uh, and, and again, be a publisher in the middle of nowhere and communicate to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions around the planet. So I, 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 that was the 30 some images from 10 days, two weeks roughly, traveling. And I just wanted to, to close on this one here uh, that I think Kurt showed also, is this fact of how I, 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 I really, really see this as I'm, I'm going back, not in time, 
time because I'm living in the present and I'm moving forward in the future and I love the future of photography. Uh, but I feel like I'm using a Roliflex. I'm, I'm looking down through and I can watch you and I'm going to turn on my camera now. And that's a neat thing if you, uh, I think Kurt showed you, um, you turn it on, you plug it in, and I'm not the salesperson because I don't know how, how to sell anything, but bingo, the camera just appears. And then you compare the, the iPhone and the other, you'll never get that kind of detail in your iPhone. You just can't. It doesn't have the dynamic range to do it. So that's my presentation of my time in Kyrgyzstan. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.